Hi, I'm Pastor Johnny, and you're watching Journey to the Cross Bible Study On Demand. Okay, hi, I am Brother Tacho, and we are once again back at Journey to the Cross Church, and I am joined by my better half, my media naranja, my 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 side here, my rib, my help me, the beautiful Miss Maria of the Tribe of Diaz. <laughs> All right. Uh, we also have in the study group today. We have Pastor George. We have Pastor Johnny. We have Brother Fred. Sister, I'm sorry. What is it? What, what was your sister? Sister D. Sister D. And then Brother Johnny's son. Who's that over there? Which one of these is? Joel, Brother Joel. So we got a large group today. Uh, Brother Chulo and his wife are joining us. So there is a lot of people in house. I expect someone to throw out a question here, or there, here or there. We got some shout outs to give, uh, you know, right off the bat. First of all, I want to thank Brother Johnny once again for allowing us, giving us the opportunity to be able to do this second part of Esther. Amen. Amen. This, uh, this is a really uh, exciting book and, and I, Maria and I have had a lot of fun studying for it. And uh, it's been a real blessing to us. And so uh, I want to give a sh that shout out to Johnny. Thank you so much once again for allowing us the opportunity to come back and teach. Um, I, I, I have some bad news for you. We're going to have to do a part three. This is a big book. So there's going to be a chapter. There's going to be another cliffhanger in the oh. book of Esther. So I'm going to leave you hanging there. So uh, we won't finish Esther today, but we're going to try and finish it on part three. I think we'll finish it on part three. And then we'll wrap it up nice and neat. Um, a couple of other shout outs I want to give. Uh, as I was talking to brother outside, I want to shout out to brother Robert. Brother Robert, I know you're on the road. You're probably going to be listening to this while you're on the road. So I want to specifically throw a shout out to you. Look at the traffic. Don't, just listen. Don't watch the video. Just listen while you're driving. Uh, and finally, two special shout outs. We want to shout out, out to the Philippines. The Philippines is tuning in. Philippines, we love you. And also to Singapore. Singapore, we love you. We want to say hi. We want to give you a shout out. We love you in the name of Jesus. And so I think that's all the shout outs, baby. Is that, is that all the shout outs? Uh, anybody else? Anybody else got another shout out? All right. Well, if we do not, Brother Johnny has tasked me. We have a giveaway to do, right? Uh, what are we giving away today, babe? Motivational Prayers for Men mm. by Tony Evans. All right. Men need motivational prayers. A lot of times it's tough for us to stay motivated, especially about our walk with Messiah, with all the stresses of life that goes on and what have you. We can easily get sucked into being a type of man that we are not supposed to be, a type of man that this world tries to make us, but that's not the type of men that we are. We're supposed to be motivated about the Father. We're supposed to be motivated about Christ. We're supposed to be motivated about the Holy Spirit, the scriptures. That's what we're supposed to be motivated about. So I highly recommend this book by Pastor Tony Evans. So what is the question? We gotta give a question. So the first person to, to, to call in the answer or to text in the answer, um, or put it on, uh, I guess on Facebook, right? Is that what we're gonna do? Okay, so first person to put it on Facebook, okay? And if you're here, George, you cannot answer. George, got a, George Pastor, George, anybody that's got a pastor before their name, Pastor Johnny, Pastor George, y'all cannot answer. That's basically cheating, okay? <laughs> y'all know this information, I know y'all know this information. So, the question of the day is, and it was all in last week's lesson, I'll probably say it even again in this week's lesson, what is Esther's Hebrew name? What is Esther's Hebrew name? Now, you gotta send it in, or if you're here, you can raise your hand if you know it, off the top of your head, shout it out, but that is the prize. So I think we have all the commercially type stuff out of the way and all the highs, all the salutations. So let's say a word of prayer, babe, and then let's get right into the word. Amen? Amen. All right. Abba Father, we come before you today, Father God, and I pray that this word is a special word to someone listening today, Father God. I pray for those who are listening right now in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray that their life be blessed. I pray, Heavenly Father, that their lives will be covered in complete shalom, Heavenly Father. I pray wherever they are right now, Father God, whatever struggle they're struggling with, the young to the old, Father God, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be there with them right now to cover them, to be right next to them, to comfort them, Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit teaches this word. I pray that our flesh would not, Father God, 
Remove all flesh, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask. Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Now, in case anybody's wondering what Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach is, I, I sometimes I'll describe it. It means in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, in Hebrew. So I throw that in there every once in a while, so you'll hear me say that. And people will ask, you know, what does Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach mean? It means in the name of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ. So in the name of Christ. That's how we end that prayer. Amen? So... Uh, babe, I think we worked it out earlier that you're going to do the reading part of it, and then I'm going to do the explanation part of it, and so, and then every once in a while I'm going to turn to you and I'm going to go, babe, what do you think? No, <laughs> no, okay. So, but feel free to jump in because we want some, we want some insight from you as well. Okay. So, will she jump in? Stay tuned. Okay. So, go ahead and read. We're actually going to start in uh, Esther chapter two, and we're going to start in verse seventeen. So, babe, whenever you're ready. It says, now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. Okay, perfect. Now, so a little bit of an explanation. Now, I know we went back just a little bit in what we, what we did, what we covered last week, but I wanted to kind of connect the two sections together, and this is our little bridge. Now, we, we got through the first and second chapter, and what we are doing is, you know, you may be thinking like, okay, this book should be over. You know, she got to be queen, you know, and so there's a couple things that we need to look out for. Esther becomes, uh, becomes the queen and finds favor with the king. The, the king favors Esther. Okay, and we understood last week why she why he favored Esther because she was a woman of godly order. She did things the way that they were supposed to be done. She followed instructions and she followed the, uh, the advice of Haggai. She listened to her uh, her cousin Mordecai. She was a woman that was willing to listen. She was just a believer that was willing to listen, obedient. and she was obedient exactly. Um, now, where did you stop reading? Uh, chapter eighteen. Verse eight. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Excellent. Go ahead and continue on. Okay, so verse 19. When the virgins were assembled... You know what? I'm so sorry. Let me pause you real quick. I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, but I also want to point out now, because this, this little theme keeps coming up, this banquet theme, right? We talked about banquets last week. But notice at the end of this section, the king throws a banquet for Esther. And I just realized that as Maria was reading it. Now, you, you see Vashti had her own banquet. He had his own banquet. The, Esther becomes queen. She throws a banquet, right? Now, the king, by showing his favor, throws a banquet for her, okay? And so, uh, don't, I just want to point that out because that theme of banquet is going to come up again. Okay, go ahead, babe. I'm sorry. I promise not to interrupt again until, okay. until we get to the point. It's okay. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do. For she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions, as she had done when he was bringing her up. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles. All this was recorded in the Book of the Annals in the presence of the king. Okay, so uh, right off the bat, before we go any further, we actually have a winner to the question. It's Sister Esme. Sometimes you're gonna hear me do this this kind of this thing off camera, like I'm getting signals. It's either George or Johnny or brother or, or brother Trudeau uh, talking to me. So I'm like, so if it looks funny, uh, you know that, that's what's going on. So we have a winner. It is Sister Esme. Sister Esme, congratulations. Amen. Oh, it's not Sister Esme. Oh, it is Sister Esme. No, I'm just kidding. Amen. Well, I don't know why they're playing with me like that. Sister Esme, congratulations. We have this book for you. Good job. And what what was the answer? What was the answer? Hadassah. It was Hadassah. That is correct. Exactly, exactly. So it's it's Hadassah. Esther's Hebrew name is Hadassah. Yes, yes. And uh, just as a little side note, Esther is a derivative of a pagan god Ishtar. Okay, so that's that's her that's her non-Hebrew name. All right. So 
back to what Maria just read. So she read a lot. We're going to get right back into it. So um, let me make sure I can read my notes here. Uh, Esther is still obedient to her cousin Mordecai. Okay, so Mordecai now is in a position at the king's gate. Now, historically speaking, and this is important, historically speaking, Mordecai, Mordecai gets elevated. Now, obviously, because Esther is now queen, she is able to do favors for him, like anybody in a high position. So she wants it. Basically, she wants to take care of, of the man who raised her. Right. So he puts her in. A, he puts him in a spot uh, at the king's gate. And that's really going to be important later on in our story. So uh, at the king's gate, he's uh, he's got this position now. Right. And that's where a lot of royal decisions are made. A lot of important people are in that spot. Geographically, it's it's uh, it, it talks about being in a high position. Right. A position where decisions are made now. And of course, Esther is still obedient to the instructions of her cousin. You know, he's he, she's still she's still listening to him. If he if he says, don't don't reveal your Jewishness yet. And she is she is still being obedient. OK, now in verses 21 through 23, we find an interesting little story. It's almost just like it's dropped in there. OK, so now we enter into the part where we start we start looking at the cloak and dagger kind of stuff that's going on in the royal court, okay? We start looking at, at kind of the drama that's going on. And what, what happens is, is two people are, are plotting to kill the king. Mordecai finds out about it, okay? And this is gonna become really important next week. That's part of the cliffhanger right there. So next week, don't forget this little small, these, these three small verses, okay? So Mordecai uncovers this plot and he lets Esther know. Esther then turns around and tells the king, OK, so she is she still has his favor. She still got his right ear. She can go directly to him. And she is she is able to just she's able to uncover the uh, he's able to uncover the plot. She passes it on to the king. The king investigates. And these people are these people are brought to justice. OK, they end up getting killed. So uh, <clears throat> but remember that little story, because that little story is going to be important. OK, babe, continue on. After these events, King Xerxes honored Haman, son of Hammedatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. So let me go ahead and pause you right there. And I don't know how we're going we're gonna to do the pausing, but I'm going to try and do the pausing piece by piece. But then I'm going to let it read large sections of the, of the scriptures so we can get through it. Okay, so what is an Agagite? Okay, and this is really, really interesting. So a lot of, uh, a lot of biblical scholars and, and uh, Hebrew sages believe that the Agagite, that Agagite part was, Haman was a direct descendant of the Amalekites. And it takes us back to 1 Samuel chapter 15, where Saul was supposed to wipe out the Amalekites. Okay. And he didn't do it. He didn't do it. He, he killed a lot of them, but he left, he spared the king and he spared the, the herds. Right. And he was wanting, he was basically wanting to keep the herds. Samuel shows up and he's really cross with him. He's really upset because Saul didn't follow God's instructions to the letter. OK, so through this, they believe that Haman is a descendant of that king Ag, uh, Agag and he is an Agagite. OK, so that's where that kind of goes all the way back to that point. It actually even goes further. It goes all the way back to Genesis because the Amalekites are a descendant of Esau. And Esau and Jacob were always at war with one another. Okay? I don't know. If it's got to take it back all the way to the very beginning. So we see that, that, that it just goes all the way to the past, right? Okay, babe, I'm going to try not to stop you again. <laughs> all the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day, they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore, they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated, for he had told them he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Where are you at? Uh, going to verse 7. Yeah. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, 
In the first month, the month of Nisan, the pur, that is the lot, was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day and month, and the lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued to destroy them, and I will give 10,000 talents of silver to the king's administrators for the royal treasury. So the king took his signet ring from his finger and gave it to Haman, son of Hamartha, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. All right, let's go ahead and pause right there because there is a lot of information. So what we're going to do, we're taking this story here. Now remember, the focus is Queen Esther. So we're going to break this down a little bit. But now, and, and you would think, now that she's the queen, that again, that should be the end of the story. She, she won. She's the queen. She's ruling. But nope. We're introduced to a plot, and now we're introduced to the enemy. Haman is the enemy, and we all have an enemy. Okay. Now we we learned about we learned about how Haman was an Agagite, and so our enemy takes us all the way back to the very beginning. But in verses two through four, what he does is he 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 finds out that Mordecai, being a Jew, does not want to bow down and worship. Now it should be understood that this was a king's commandment. The king had commanded that everybody should bow down and worship him. And it, it's now Mordecai gives the reason. He says, I can't do that. And his, his buddies are all there. They're at the king's gate. Well, why, why are you doing this? Why You're just aggravating him. You know, why, why won't you bow down? <sighs> okay, look, it's because I'm a Jew. I'm not allowed to. So right there, that text shows us that there that this was a particular type of bowing down, maybe not necessarily like a regular bowing to honor a king, but this was something a little bit more going beyond just your regular showing homage to someone of a higher position. There was some serious bowing down, maybe even crossing into worship where Mordecai felt convicted that he was breaking Torah, okay? And so when he says, I can't do it, I'm a Jew. And so what do his friends do? They're sitting around, they're like, they go and snitch on him. They go, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. They go and snitch on him. They go and snitch on him and they tell Haman. And they're like, well, let's just see what, let's just see what, what, what Mordecai will do. You know, let's see, let's see if he's really a Jew. Let's find out. Let's say, let's find out how committed he is to his covenant. Let's find out how committed he is to his God. Let's find out in Christian church how committed we are to our relationship with the Lord, right? And what does Haman do? Okay. Haman is not even remotely satisfied with taking out Mordecai, okay? The, the, the story would probably would end if you just would have taken out Mordecai. He says, no, I'm going to wipe out all of them. I'm going to take out every single one of the covenant people that, that is here, in, that is in the province. So Haman finds his opportunity right there, and he's going to go after every single one. Now, in verse 7, Verse 7 demonstrates, if you, if you, uh, do me a favor, read verse 7 again for me. Seven. Verse 7, yes. Chapter 3, verse 7. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the pur, that is the lot, was cast in the presence of Haman to select a day and month. And the lot fell on the twelfth month, the month of Adar. Okay, so there's a lot of information in there about the names of the months and this word pur and all this stuff going on. What was basically happening... Now we're getting into spiritual warfare, okay? That's exactly what we are doing. Haman was a pagan, and what he does is he uses witchcraft, okay? He's drawing lots, and, and now he, would have, he could have been doing a, a, couple, of, a couple of various things that, that are typical to, uh, to, to pagan societies uh, when they're using witchcraft, because what he's trying to determine is he is asking the gods, what is the best day to completely wipe out the Jews? So what does he do? He casts lots. Now he may have been throwing what they what they call reading bones or reading some tea leaves or reading the stars. It doesn't really give us the exact thing that he was doing, but he was involved in witchcraft. That is very, very clear because he is trying to figure out the best day to wipe out. And that's what the word per means. It means to cast a lot, to do a reading, to foretell the future of future events, to try to determine what you're going to do. 
okay? And that's what he was doing. So he was he was in he was in witchcraft. So again, we have this theme of spiritual warfare coming up, right? Um, now he is so he is so bent on destroying the Jews. He goes to the king and he starts explaining to him, you've got these people, these Jews living in your kingdom and it is not good for you to have them because they, they don't follow the king's orders. It's best you just do away with them. I'll tell you what, king, I will even pay to have these people wiped out. I'll put money in the king's treasury so that you can wipe And the king's like, no, 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 I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. I'll, I'll put the money forward, okay? So the, and the king is none the wiser. Okay? The king is none the wiser of this whole situation. He's not, he's not the wiser about Haman being angry. He's not the wiser of Mordecai not bowing down. More, uh, Haman just explains to him, I want to kill the Jews. And so he goes above and beyond to completely exterminate the people of God. Okay. I also want to point out. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Um, how his hatred, Haman's hatred, um, how him not being able to control his anger. His hatred overcame him, and how uh, gossip and, and, and spreading your hatred um, can cause so much harm. Uh, you know, he said there's a certain people, you know, it, hatred, prejudice, there's so much in this world that we see um, going on in this chapter as well. Amen. A lot of practical application here. A lot of practical application. So I, I encourage us. We need to we need to be better Christians. We need to we need to not operate in hate because this is when we start operating in hate, we start going into the area of Haman. We start going into the area of the enemy. George was talking to me this morning, and, and it was a, we were talking about a real funny story. And one of the instructors was uh, was really giving his, his students a really tough time, and one of the students called him Haman. And so, and, and that's that's what we demonstrate. That's the type of character that we demonstrate when we when we as believers operate in hate. So I encourage you, even with everything going on, everything going on, one of the fruits of the spirit is self-control. We need to not operate in hate. And so that we're, we're supposed to operate in love, not hate. So where are we, baby? Well, we left off on Haman being the enemy of the Jews. So Haman ends up being declared in the book of Esther, the enemy of the Jews. Okay. Now the Jews obviously here are, are, are can easily be seen as a type, okay? Who is our enemy? It's clear. It's very, very clear. And he, he is labeled the enemy of the Jews, just like the enemy of the church is the enemy, right? And so uh, so we're still seeing this spiritual warfare coming out. And even with uh, the other people um, that every day we're talking to Mordecai, trying to get him to bow down to the king, mm. it's kind of like our coworkers, our, the people around us, you know? trying to yeah. get us you know our friends be, yeah our friends trying to get us to do what we're not supposed to be doing amen so i knew she was going to jump in i knew she was going to jump in she said i'm a little nervous no 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 she's got this <laughs> okay so verse 11 keep the money the king said to haman and do with the people as you please then on the 13th day of the first month the royal secretaries were summoned they wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various provinces, and the nobles of the various people. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day the 13th day of the 12th month and the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. The couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. Amen. So let's continue on with our little analysis, our comparative analysis here. Okay. So here we find, and, and, I, and this is where it really begins to solidify. Well, first and foremost, the Haman, Haman convinces the king so much that he makes it a royal decree. He gets all the scribes together. We're going to make this official. 
we are going to wipe out the Jews on this date. Okay, get the get the scribes in here, get a, get the couriers on horseback, get the letters out to the provinces. The whole kingdom is going to follow this order. So the king was was all in. Okay, he was completely all in, and that's just how the enemy works. The enemy works just. Go ahead, go ahead. you got something. I know she does. I know she got something. She got that look. So the, the king gave him his ring. So kind of like how we can give the control to the enemy mm. in the same way, right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Just like that. There, there is a lot of times where we turn over control to the enemy because we've lost control. Amen. That's a good point, babe. Good point. Okay, so verse 13 is a really, really important verse. Uh, babe, would you mind reading that verse again? 13? Yeah. It says, Dispatchers were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Okay, it's interesting. If you listen to the verse, it reminds me of another verse in John 10.10. 10. The enemy, the thief has come, but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. This guy was wanting to kill, to annihilate, and plunder. It's the exact same thing. We see the enemy being exposed right here. And if you look at it, you can tell this is, Haman is a type of Satan. And, it, and lastly, in verse 15, and I thought this was really, really interesting. Would you mind reading 15 again? Okay. The couriers went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was bewildered. Okay, and some, in some versions it says the city of Susa was in confusion. All right, who brings confusion? Who brings Tavel? That's Hebrew for confusion. Who brings Tavel? It's confusion. The enemy brings confusion. So we see in chapter four, this is, this is an introduction to the bad guy. This is an introduction to the enemy. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He brings confusion in your life. So we see that Esther is, is demonstrated as someone who is obedient. And now a situation is rising up. And a lot of times, brothers and sisters, it's not when we get to that point where we think we have a victory. Now I'm in a position. Now I'm in a ministry. We're going we're to cover that a little bit more. You know, now I'm in a high place, right? You may, just like Esther was queen, she was elevated. She used to be an orphan. Now she's queen of the whole country. And all of a sudden, the enemy rises up. And he's not satisfied. I'm going to wipe out everybody that you're related to, that you're associated with. When the enemy comes to comes after you, he's not playing. He's not playing with you. He's going to take your life. He's going to try and take your people. He's going to try and take your kids. He's going to try and take your finances, your health. You have to be ready to stand up and ready to fight. Because the enemy means business. Amen? All right. So I think now, now that we've introduced the enemy... We are now in chapter four. Go ahead, babe. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. Okay, go ahead and pause right there. I, I got to point this little detail out. I want you to miss the detail. Okay, so Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. That's where he was working. That's his job. He's in a position. Now he finds out all these messengers by courier have been sent out, right? So he finds out the Jews are going to be wiped out, right? He finds out, oh, it's going to be on the, on the, thir the 13th day of Adar. The 13th day of Adar, we're going to wipe out the Jews. So he starts tearing his clothes. He is, he is just beside himself. He puts on sackcloth and ashes. He is absolutely, that's a symbol of depression. That's a symbol of great, great sorrow. Okay, so he knows that his people are about to be destroyed. But he only went as far as the entrance to the king's gate. Because according to royal decree, you cannot go into the king's gate with sackcloth and ashes. The king doesn't want to see anybody depressed. Kind of living in this little fantasy world of his. Like, no, 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 don't bring anybody sad in my presence. Okay? Uh, go ahead. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female tenants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. 
She sent clothes for him to put on instead of sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Man, this is, this right here, this chapter really made me just like think that Esther was just awesome. Okay. First of all, let me point out, okay, uh, Hathak, the king's eunuch that's going between Esther and Mordecai. Now, what's going on here? Mordecai is, Mordecai is depressed. He's in sackcloth. He's in ashes. He doesn't want to be consoled. Esther decides, let me, send, she hears about this. So let me send some clothes that he can put on so he can get cleaned up, so he can come out of whatever he's dealing with, and we can, I can find out what's going on with him. So then Hathak comes, is, is transferring these messages back and forth between Queen Esther and Mordecai. And she's run, he's running back and forth and he's delivering these messages. Mordecai tells her what's going on, even sends her the text. Now this isn't a text. This is the text. <laughs> this is the text that's not talking. I, I heard text and I was like, oh, text? No, not that text. Not that text. So it's, it's, it's way back in, in ancient days. They didn't have text back then. They had regular text, the text, right? And so, um, so he even sends a copy of that text so that she can read. And so what he does is he explains to her, he explains to her the order to kill the Jews. Hathak is obviously going to know that Mordecai and Esther, the queen, are Jews. But did you notice in the story, he doesn't say a word. He doesn't mention anything to anyone about Esther and her Jewish background. That, that says a lot about Esther. That says, and, that, and quite honestly, that's the king's eunuch. The king's eunuch was given to Esther, right? He became her eunuch, but she had so much grace and so much favor that he was willing to keep that secret, even unto him, probably even unto his own death. That's how committed he was to her. That speaks volumes about her character to, to start off. And then as we continue on, this chapter gives us another character analysis of Esther, but a really amazing one, okay? She understands, when she sends uh, one of her messages back, she says, look, I can't just willy-nilly go into the presence of the king without being summoned, according to royal law. If I go into the presence of the king without being summoned, that is my life. I will be killed, right? And then Mordecai gives the, the, the famous speech. He says, you know, you you will, well, what is the famous speech, man? <laughs> Go ahead and read the famous speech. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. 
For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Amen. For such a time as this. Now, there's a lot of things that are going on with Esther right now. She is very aware that she is taking her life into her own hands, right? But I want you, I want to point out something to you, okay? She has a ministry. She is a woman with a ministry. Now, there are three ministries in the Old Testament that you were anointed for. And I'm going to go backwards with them, okay? One, the high priest was anointed for that ministry, right? Two, the prophet was anointed for that ministry. And finally, the king was anointed for that ministry, right? Well, she is a queen. She was also anointed for that ministry. And not just in a spiritual sense. If you remember chapter one, what did she have to go through? She had to go through preparations and treatments with oils. She was anointed for that ministry. And many of us are anointed for the ministry, but we fail to understand Many of us don't want to face our own death. That's what, that's what a ministry actually means. Are you willing to give up your life? Are you willing to put yourself between the people that you serve and your enemy? That's what Esther is doing right here. She comes to that understanding. Mordecai, Mordecai explains the situation. She is fully aware, fully aware of what could happen to her. And then her famous words after she finds out, if I die, I die. If I die, I die. And Mordecai, Mordecai had told her, he says, just maybe, just maybe, this, if you, were, if you were brought to this position for such a time as this. And I want to tell you, believer, you may be a believer, you may be a minister, and it may be for such a time as this. And this is a call. To all of us believers, all of us ministers, all of us who say we serve the Lord, are you willing to take your life into your own hands for the Father, for the people that you that you that you defend, for your sheep, for your sheep? Because, like I said, the enemy is not playing; he is not playing, and there are precious few people that stand in the gap. Esther shows us her character. She says, "This is what I was called to do." I was anointed. She didn't just think of her position as, I'm up here, I'm safe. And it's sad. It's sad that sometimes we have ministers that, I've got my position. I've got my position. And they don't think of anybody else. Not Esther. Not Esther. She was willing to take her life into her own hands. This morning, George and I were talking about that. There's a correlation there with, uh, with the high priest, right? The high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle one time a year. One time a year. If he messed up, he was done. And by, by done, I mean he would die in the Holy of Holies, in the presence of God. And he had to come to that understanding. I have to go do this. I have to enter into the Holy of Holies so I can offer the sacrifice for the people outside. He understood every time he went into the Holy of Holies to go before God, that he was the go-between between God and people, just like Esther understood that she was that go but she was that salvation point between her people and the enemy. And she was willing to take her life into her own hands. And she makes that statement, if I perish, then I perish. This woman understood her time in history and she understood her ministry. And she took it seriously. It wasn't just that I'm the queen. It was, I'm here to serve my people. And she took that seriously. Let's see here. I'm just reading my notes. Yeah, let's continue on. Let's continue on. That was, that's, that was an awesome chapter. I love that chapter. We got one man that's what was going on in those times. Okay, Xerxes hadn't called on her. She said this hadn't called on her for at least 30 days that we know of, right? It was obvious in, in those first couple chapters that she had his favor. He was in love with her. He doted on her. She was the new queen, but he had kingly stuff that he had to do. He has a country to run. So he hadn't called on her in a very, very long time, okay? And quite honestly, we may be walking around in our ministry and we may have not heard anything from our king for a long, long time. 
for a long, long time. But I want to tell you something. Just like Queen Esther still had the favor of the king. He extended that scepter. He extended that scepter and said, I still favor you. I still favor you. You're still favored, believer. You are still favored. You may not have heard from God in a while. God maybe hasn't moved in your life in a minute or two. You may not have gotten into, the, into that deep spiritual warfare or into those tongues or that, that great sweet spot in your prayer closet. But God still favors you. God still loves you. God still fights for you. God still extends his, his scepter to you and says, I accept you. You are my queen. You are my bride. And I love you. And that's powerful. That's a powerful message right there. Now, just a little bit of just a little bit of a, a little bit of working knowledge here. So Queen Esther comes up and he says, request what you want, even up to half of my kingdom. That was kind of a now, don't think that Esther was going to come up and ask for half of the kingdom. Okay? That was just a traditional way of that the king would respond, especially if he favored somebody. If I favor you, man, I'll give you whatever you want, even half. I'll give you half of what I have. I love this woman so much, I'll give her half. So, <laughs> give, her, give her my half my paycheck, right? So, <laughs> so uh, in verse 4, okay, again, we have this banquet theme going on. The banquets aren't going away. I don't know why we're, we're banqueting so much. But here is this banquet again. She knows what to do. Esther just does what Esther does. God created you in such a way, believer, you know what to do. Do what you were created to do. And it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting com uh, co uh, contrast and comparison. You go back to the first chapter of this book, we find out that Vashti was doing separate banquets. She's doing separate banquets. He's doing his banquet. I'm doing my banquet. He's got his thing going on. I got my thing going on. There's no connection between her and the king, right? But not Queen Esther. She's like, oh no, I need to be connected. I need to be connected to my king, right? So she throws a banquet for him. She shows that she loves him. Brother Johnny, you got something. A lot of people want to want to be like maybe a Billy Graham or a T.D. Jakes, but they don't understand that God has anointed you for something specific in your life. You're not called to, you can, get, you can learn many things from those people, but God calls you specifically. And, and you have things that TV Jakes doesn't have or Billy Graham never had. Because you're, you, you are unique. You have, you have, you're created, the Bible says in, in Psalms that you are a masterpiece. Amen. Created by God. So stop running around trying to get somebody's anointing. Walk in your anointing. Amen. Amen. Uh, I don't know if you guys were able to hear that, but Johnny just, just shared something very profound. A lot of times we try to walk in somebody else's anointing. Maybe someone that we someone that we enjoy listening to, someone that we get a lot of information from. Like for example, T D Jakes or Billy Graham that he was he was saying. And sometimes we think we want to be that person. God created you, and I'm gonna use Johnny's words, uniquely to be you. Walk in your anointing. Amen. 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 That's wonderful. Um, so again, we, we have this, this theme of the banquet and she's like, no, I, I need to connect to my king. And so I'm going to show him love. I'm going to show him who he is to me. You know, he, she's not a Vashti. Sorry, guys. She's not a Vashti. She's a queen. She's a queen Esther. And that's how we need to be. We need to stay connected to our king. Amen. All right. We're going to cover this last section of chapter five and we're going to end off right here. I'm going to leave you in a cliffhanger. Like Brother Chula Bob says, what happened to Esther? We're going to find out next week. Next week. So let's go ahead, babe. Esther replied, my petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet. I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits, but when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, 
his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Suresh and all his friends said to him, have a pole set up reaching to a height of 50 cubits and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman and he had the pole set up. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. So again, we get another quick look at Haman and how he's compared to the enemy, okay? So in verse 13, we find out that he's not satisfied, okay? So basically what ends up happening is, is Esther invites the king and Haman, okay? And so he is, he is floating on, he should be floating on cloud nine, right? He's like invited, he's invited just, just him. It's the king and then just him, not any of the other princes, not any of the other, other people of the royal court, just Haman. And you would think that he would be satisfied with that. You would think he would be happy with that, but he's not. He's not. Now, I want to point out, Haman had a very elevated position. When we first find out about Haman, he was put above all the other princes, all the other princes in the court, okay? He was probably the second or third in charge from the king, okay? At least, at least the third, but most likely the second, okay? And so he was in a very elevated position. Now, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 tells us something really interesting. It says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. And we can easily make the comparison between Haman and the enemy. If you read Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, and Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 18, those chapters and verses describe the pride and the fall of Satan, okay? But it's very, very obvious that pride came, the pride of the enemy when he was an angel, when he was a cherub serving and covering the Lord, covering the throne of the Lord. He, he was prideful and then he fell. George, did you have something? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I thought, I thought you had something to share. Um, and so we can see very clearly again Haman is is uh, is is this is this comparison with Satan, and it's just so sad. It's so sad. He should have been happy. He goes home and he starts telling his his family and his friends and his wife, and he's telling them like, okay, well, this happened and this happened, and and the queen only invited me, and I'm, I get to enjoy the, the dinner, but I'm not satisfied because of Mordecai, that Jew, that person. I can't take it. He was so enraged. He was so full of himself. He was so full of pride that he could not enjoy what was around him. He couldn't enjoy the elevated position that he had. And it's so sad that, that we can get to that point as human beings, as human beings that we let anger and pride consume our hearts so much that we think of absolutely Nothing else but vengeance and destruction and arrogance. So much so that it robs us of our peace. And it's interesting. Uh, Maria, you have something? Yeah, I just want to say how you were saying about how uh, many times our anger uh, can rob us of our peace. And, and we see it with Haman, but with um, what's her name? Esther, uh, she, she brought her enemy to the king. Just like you can bring your petition, your prayer, you can pray about your enemy, you can bring bring that to the king. You know? Amen. Um, that's what she, but that's the difference. Amen. Amen. Very, a very clear difference between our heroine and uh, and the enemy. You know, she... God's people and not God's people. Exactly. Exactly. That we have that, we have that benefit to be able to bring our enemy before the king. And so, uh, last but not least, uh, the advice, let's build a pole. Let's go now. Some versions will say a gallows so that we can hang uh, Mordecai on, but uh, other versions like uh, NIV and, and uh, even I think in the original Hebrew is that the plan was to build a, a, a pole and they were going to impale 
Mordecai on it. And now all of a sudden, Mordecai, and now all of a sudden, excuse me, Haman is happy. He's like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. So we are going to end the chapter right there. Right there. So now it's all set up. So tomorrow, according to the chapter, the following day, he's going to kill Mordecai. He's going to kill Mordecai. And he's going to go in. So he's going to sleep. There's going to be a banquet tomorrow. He's going to go to the banquet. And while he's there, he's going to talk to the king. And I'm going to have Mordecai impaled. The world is good. And so that's where we're at right now. There is, there is so much in these few chapters right here for us to be able to, to learn and glean from and to be able to draw from our, for our walk here. There, there's a lot that we can learn from Esther. There's a lot that we can learn about our enemy. There's a lot even that we can learn from, uh, from even Vashti on how not to be. You know, Esther gives us a, an amazing, amazing example of our walk and how our walk should be Amen. and how brave we should be in our walk. I said it, I said it this Sunday, our walk, Christianity is not easy. It's not for the weak. It's not for the weak. We got to be fighters. We got to be fighters. And why do we got to be fighters? Because our kids depend on us. Our friends depend on us. Our loved ones, our spouses depend on our prayers. People who cannot defend themselves against the enemy are depending on the gospel that is written in our hearts, on the relationship that we have with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. How dare we become lazy? How dare we become lazy? We shouldn't be like that. And I want to encourage you tonight, believers. Be an Esther. Be a Hadassah. Be a Hadassah. Wherever you are, be the covenant people that you were called to be. And fight your enemy. Babe, you got the last word. I'll let you take the last word. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's, she's not just the best wife in the world for nothing. <laughs> so, but um, another thing. Okay, I got it. <laughs> she's like, huh. <laughs> you notice that um, Esther didn't on the in the first banquet. She didn't ask, you know, the king for whatever it is that she's going to ask. But she comes for another one. Like she spends more time. She wants more time in his presence. And that's Amen. something I think is important for us not to always want a quick answer, a quick, you know, spend more time. Amen. Seek him more. Amen. Amen. That's that's definitely an awesome, awesome nugget that we that we Amen. spend more time in the Lord. Um George, do you have anything that you want to share? You want to, anything you want to bring up? This is a great, great study. Thank you all for doing Praise it. God. Thank Praise so God. Much. Pastor Johnny? Anything you want to add? There's a lot. There's a lot there. A lot of good nuggets there. All right, cool. So we're gonna end it off right here. I uh, and Johnny has blessed us again. Next week we're gonna we're gonna wrap up Esther. Uh, and it'll be an honor to to join you again next week on Wednesday. We'll be here and we'll hopefully we'll wrap up uh, Esther. Chula Bob, we gotta find out Nick. We gotta come yeah. next week to find out what happens to Esther. They <laughs> gotta, gotta get the popcorn together. And so I just want to end off. I just want to end off in prayer. Uh, before we close, and I just want to tell you, be encouraged, brothers and sisters. Be encouraged. You are a royal priesthood. You're a royal priesthood. There is more to you than what even you believe, than what even you believe. So let's go into the presence of the King. Amen? Abba Father, tonight we come before you, Father, and I'm encouraged just hearing this lesson come out of my mouth, Father God, for my brothers and sisters. Lord, I take that message, it, it, it just speaks to my heart, Heavenly Father. It encourages me, Father God. It convicts my heart, Heavenly Father, that I need to be taking my ministry that much more seriously, Father God, that I need to be standing in the gap for my brothers and sisters, that I need to be reaching out and being in the presence of the King and desiring to be in the presence of the King. That, as the song says, is how we fight our battles. That is how we do our warfare. We do our warfare in prayer. We do our warfare in fasting. We do our warfare in confidently walking in who we are and the anointing that we have. So be encouraged, brothers and sisters. Lord, I pray encouragement right now, whatever situation that my brothers and sisters are going through, I pray that they would be encouraged and lifted up knowing who they are, Father God. Remind them, Lord. Remind them that you extend your scepter out to them and you favor them, Father God. I ask you every one of these things.
Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. amen. Okay. We'll see you guys next week. Shalom.